That's Nick. And that's Joseph, and today we're here to talk about The Vast of Night, which will be available to stream on Amazon Prime May 29th, 2020. It is the directorial debut of Andrew Patterson, and it premiered at the 2019 Slamdance Film Festival. Uh, it is what you would call a lo-fi sci-fi, I believe. Okay, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to explain the story. Okay, so it's set in the 1950s in New Mexico. Cayuga, New Mexico. There are two young people, one who is a radio DJ, the yep. other one is the switchboard operator. And, and, and in high school. And in high school. Mm -hmm. She's getting calls about these, like, sounds. Right? Well, first she's getting calls. It starts out where they are um, preparing for a school basketball game. Okay. And then she is, um, Faye, played by Sierra McCormick, is being interviewed by Jake Horowitz, who's this radio DJ for this new program, he's, this interview program he's doing. And then she goes to her shift as a switchboard operator, and it starts out with um, some woman calling, saying that she sees a large object in the sky. And then shortly after that, she starts getting these strange transmissions of these garbled noises that almost sound like human mumbling. And she calls Everett, the radio DJ, and asks him if he has any idea what this is, and he decides to broadcast it on his radio program. A gentleman calls in, mm -hmm. Billy, who says he used to be in the armed forces. He did this like special mission project where they would like monitor these sounds and communicate with the sounds and that there was something that would seem to visit periodically. And digging, they were digging tunnels. Yes. So he, of course, the radio DJ is like, uh, this doesn't sound real. Like, how do we know this is real? Because he also doesn't want to give like his information. So they're like, how can we verify this? And Billy says, there's proof. There are recordings. And if you can find those recordings, then because the uh, like sort of sort of the phenomenon they're experiencing at that moment, Billy says that if you play these recordings, like it'll like they'll communicate. Yeah. And then the whatever it is in the sky will come down. Like the map legend. <laughs> so they find these tapes. Uh, they're stored. They, they've uh, been moved to like the local library. They find them. Um, at this point, the movie's more than halfway over, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was concerning to me. Uh, did, did you mention who Billy was? No, okay. I was going to wait. Okay, okay. So they then get in contact with this woman who says, this older woman who says she can corroborate what she heard on the radio. Mm -hmm. So she tells this long drawn out story about her son. He was abducted as a nine-year-old, but he... And how he would speak in this, like, language that she ended up, like... She had heard previously uh, from a person that was dying? Something like that. Yeah. But it, it occurred to her... She, like, took the baby to the doctor. They were just like, oh, ignore it. But she decided to write down, like, every little word this baby said, which sounds like a foreign language. I don't know. Mm -hmm. it, it sounds familiar, but it's not in English. Uh, she uh, then tells them, like please take me with you to the spaceship. And they, and they kind of get freaked out and leave because they think she's crazy and they mm -hmm. wasted their time. So as they're leaving, there's a big commotion in the town because they see lights in the sky. So the, the radio DJ and his little high school buddy run to the, to, the, to the light and it is a spaceship. And the final scene would indicate that the spaceship like sucks them up yeah, it would seem to, we did, it's not confirmed, but yeah, right. that's what I guess. And that's the end. Uh, yes, uh, and also I think it's important to note that this whole narrative is framed as if it is an episode in some a Twilight, a Zone, Twilight Zone, Outer Limits thing, and in, in here called Paradox Theater. What did I like about this film? I think the acting from the two leads, Jake Horowitz and Sierra McCormick, was very good. They had that like 1950s mm -hmm. rockabilly type vibe to them, but like the DJ guy, I thought he was really sweet and clever, and um, the young girl was also very sweet. And I find it's curious. There's really no tension developed between them at all. Well, he's over 18 and she's under. That's true, but so. I mean, there's no. I, I don't get what any of their real interests uh, in each other in are beyond the opportunities being together. Well, I think she was interested in radio. Yeah. So, you know, like he was probably a mentor to her. Uh, so I really liked their acting and the way those characters are written. 
the gentleman who calls in Billy to the radio station is a black man. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't divulge that until the end of his call. And he says it's because he thought like they wouldn't take him seriously. The DJ says like a black person's never called the radio station. So it was sort of a, I, I, I thought that was a powerful uh, well, the fact that point that he says like, he, cause he asked him, do you think that the government likes, cause the Billy says it was only blacks and Mexicans working on this project. And the DJ says, do you think that the government did that on purpose? And he's like, yeah, because they knew no one would believe us if we said anything. So I thought that the writing of like that plot point, the gentleman who voiced and read that dialogue, I thought did a very, very good job. The film looks cool. It has a mood. Bruce Davis was the name of the man that was Billy. Oh, yeah. So Bruce Davis did a great job with his voice acting. Um, the film has a cool vibe to it. It does. It does have a really, uh, it, it's, it's really a pity that you won't be seeing it in a theater uh, because the, uh, the, aud the audio is really what is kind of clues you off uh, on that ambiance. It's, sure. it's really yeah. important to the success of this film, I think. Yeah. What else did you like? Um, I, the, yeah, the acting is probably the strongest part of it. Uh, it it's just, I think it, Well, what didn't work for you? Go ahead. It's not that it didn't work for me. It's just it, trying to parse through what exactly Patterson's trying to say, or the, or the screenwriters, James Montague and Craig W. Sanger. Um, because it, it starts out where they're, where um, Faye, Sierra McCormick, is having this uh, interesting conversation about uh, technology, technological advancements they predict in the future from these articles she's read, such as like what we would call cell phones and how everybody's going to have a telephone number assigned to them at birth. Uh, and if, if they ever don't pick up that number, it means they're dead because that telephone's part of you. <laughs> Um, okay. So to me, this felt like kind of lo-fi arrival, the Denis Villeneuve film, because uh, it's all about communication, and uh, I couldn't really deduce anything further than that. I think I wanted more existential themes. I wanted this to be like there's a pair of 2013 lo-fi sci-fis, like a film called Coherence or Shane Carruth's uh, Upstream Color, uh, films that were, you know, by and large are very confusing, uh, but also uh, very intelligent and you think about, like you could go back to those and revisit them and have a new conversation about those films every time, which I don't feel the case that it is the same with this. What is that TV show with David Duchovny and... Uh, the X-Files. Yeah, I can If see. you watch the trailer for this film, you will think you're going to get something like X-Files meets Stranger Things which is appealing to me. So I was very excited, but I would say I was let down because there is nothing, I mean, nothing happens until the very end where you see a spaceship and the spaceship looks like the top of a cruise ship. Yeah. So like there are no aliens there. There really is zero activity besides them searching for the tapes. There are some really um, uh, impressive tracking shots in here. The cinematographer is M.I. Littenmans, uh, he's Chilean. Uh, he recently uh, lends the film Resistance, which I didn't like, but like there, there's some pretty uh, awesome tracking shots in here that are, it, it, this feels like a film that what could Mr. Patterson do if he had a lot of money? And I would assume a lot, but I can see why this is earning comparisons to early Spielberg, excuse me, or early Christopher Nolan even. Okay. Um, I also was reminded of uh, this Hilary Brower film I really like from 97 called The Sticky Fingers of Time. Uh, but again, like th that was playing with pulp 50s nostalgia uh, in, in ways that this doesn't. It's, this is pretty placid, I'd say. Not flaccid, placid. It's pretty an even keel through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. of, of, of a certain kind of menace, but not, I don't know. And the scene you didn't like was when they go visit the old white lady, Mabel. God, her... <laughs> Her like rambling on about her son, it just took me nowhere, and I I don't think the acting was the best. She reminded me of that especially lady. compared to Billy. Yeah, she reminded me of that lady that played Deborah Logan. That would be the taking of Deborah <laughs> Logan. <laughs> I thought it was her because it's it, that most of that scene is from her profile, and I thought it was that woman until you get to the front. I was about as irritated as the the radio DJ was when she was done talking, like how he just got up and stormed out. That's how I felt. Like hurry this shit up. <laughs> you know, it, aliens and radio transmissions. Of course, you think of War of the Worlds. You know, the infamous uh, instance where Orson Welles was reading it 
HG Orson Welles was reading HG Wells out loud on the radio and everybody got freaked out because they thought it was Well, I blame 90% of my disappointment on the trailer because the trailer's cut to really think that there'll be more action and that we will actually see something. But I don't mind a quiet film that doesn't have all the, you know, I didn't need creepy creatures, I didn't need probing or anything, but it just, I think the trailer really does not do this film justice. But. No, but then it's like, how would you sell the film then? Because if, yeah. you, if you watch the trailer and think like that is, looks like nothing's happening, you know, people won't watch it. But it's not the fact that nothing's happening, it's just... Well, well nothing, I mean... <laughs> It takes it's, it's very ruminative. It's a well done film for the it most is. part. It is. And I would watch this uh, another film by this person. Yeah, I'm excited to what see. What would you give it? I would give it three out of five. I would give it two and a half out of five. Oh. Anything else? Mm, no. Good. Bye. <laughs>